Hello. Um, so this is now the second part of my talk, um, where I talk about stable computer length and write computable numbers. And just to remind you, um, there was a first uh, defined simplicial volume and um, stated the results, namely in particular that every rational number can be realized as the simplicial volume of a four manifold. And today I will, uh, or now I will prove this result using um, an invariant called stable computer length. And then I will give an outlook on um, future uh, projects. And this will involve uh, right computable numbers. Okay, so this is where we left in the uh, previous part of the talk. Namely, I claimed uh, that uh, in theorem A that every non-negative rational number can be written as the simplicial volume of a four manifold. Okay. So um, now I will describe uh, the proof of the statement. So um, first step, um, well, uh, the statement is about the simplicial volume of four manifolds, in particular about the L1 norm in degree four. So we need to get a uh, better understanding about L1 norms. And we start this in, in, in a different case, in an easier case, uh, namely in dimension two. So first, we um, need to have a way of constructing interesting um, two classes uh, with um, controlled L1 norm. And this will use stable commutator links. Okay. After having done this, um, we have found a connection between stable commutator length and L1 norms. Um, and in this connection, we need to um, feed uh, interesting um, types of groups which satisfy certain conditions and where we can control stable commutator length so that in the end, we get interesting L1 classes. So in, in this point here, after having completed steps one and two, we have found L, um, two classes with um, where we know the L1 norm. Okay, so so far we just have two classes, so we need to um, construct four classes, and we can do this um, just by taking the product with surfaces. Um, this will give me a four class, and but we need to work a bit to actually control the L1 norm of these four classes. Okay. So maybe you realize that I so far just talked about um, basically groups. I didn't talk about manifolds so far. And at some point, we need to take those four classes and construct manifolds. And this will be done in step four by a classical result um, using a classical result of Tom, um, where using four classes in groups and um, uh, where we know the L1 norm of, we get um, manifolds which have um, those L1 uh, norms as simplicial volume. Okay, so let's start. Let's uh, look at the first point, okay? We need to find the connection between um, L1 norm in degree two and stable commutator length. Okay, so what is L1 norm in degree two? I've defined the one norm in my previous slide, but now I'm going to give a slightly different definition. Um, so suppose you have a topological space X and a two class, then L1 norm we've seen was um, how efficiently can I write this singular cycle um, in terms of um, simplices. And actually I can take those simplices and glue them together to get a surface. So I can also ask, how well can I approximate this um, cycle in terms of surfaces? Okay, so um, I'll want to look at all surfaces, sigma, uh, which map to X, such that um, they, um, in homology, they are going to be a multiple, depending on um, the, the map phi and the surface, of my class alpha. And then I want to um, uh, normalize and ask about the complexity of the surfaces. And complexity of a surface I measure by the Euler characteristic. And I want to normalize by the degree. 
And this then gives definition of some invariant. And it turns out that in this case, uh, this invariant is exactly the L1 norm. And we've already seen that the simplicia volume of surfaces is equal to uh, minus two times the other characteristics. So maybe this is not too hard to believe. And indeed, one um, inequality is uh, immediate uh, from this fact, and the other one is also not too hard to prove. OK, let's look at examples. Um, let's look at the e easiest example there is. Easiest example probably is if x is already a surface of genus 2, and if alpha is the fundamental class of the surface, then, well, I can approximate this um, two class by surfaces by just taking the identity map from um, uh, genus 2 surface to x. OK. And um, this is certainly part of this infimum here. And the degree of this map is uh, 1. OK. So I now, using this, I can see that the L1 norm um, can be bounded from above by minus 2 the other characteristic of the genus 2 surface divided by the degree. While the characteristic of the genus 2 surface is minus 2. So this gives me an upper bound of 4. And of course, in this case, this upper bound is actually sharp. Okay, so this is the um, L1 norm side. So now we're going to uh, the stable commuter length side. And here I have a slightly different object. I don't have a two class. I have a loop in my space. And I ask, well, for the um, L1 norm, I ask how efficiently can I represent this, um, the, the cycle I have given in terms of surfaces. And for the stable commuter length, I ask, how efficiently can I fill the loop um, by a surface? So um, first of all, when can I fill a loop with a surface if and only if my uh, loop um, lies in the commutator subgroup of the fundamental group of my space X? And in this case, um, there, there are some surfaces um, which have the boundary um, as boundary exactly this loop, and I can ask what's the most efficient surface um, where I measure efficiency in terms of other characteristic. I can find in order to fill this loop, um, and I allow that um, my surfaces uh, go around the boundary, go around gamma maybe multiple times, and I normalize by this degree. Okay. And this is a definition of an invariant, variant, and now this is my definition of stable commutative length. There are other definitions of stable commutative length, which is why there's a factor of two coming in, because um, uh, stable commutative length is defined as the stabilization of commutator length. And commutator length is um, um, something like the genus of a surface, and the article is about uh, twice the genus of a surface. OK, so we have already see that there's uh, lots of qualitative similarities between the L1 norm of the two class and stable commutative length. And let's just look at, an, at another, ex another example. Suppose, again, my space X is already a surface with boundary, namely just a um, torus where I remove a disk. And note that the fundamental group of a torus with one disk removed is just the free group. Um, generated by uh, the uh, loop around the middle and the loop around um, the other bits. And suppose that my um, loop in this service of boundary is just boundary, um, which um, in the free group would just be uh, correspond to the commutator relation. Okay. Then um, again, I can approximate this loop um, in terms of uh, in terms of just the identity and this identity is a surface with boundary and I can see what I get. I would get an upper bound of um, this uh, same commutative length of this loop as um, minus the other characteristic of the surface um, divided by this factor of two times the degree. In this case, the other characteristic of the surface um, with of genus one with one um, with a disk removed is 
minus one. So I get an upper bound of a half. And again, this is sharp. Okay, so we already see that probably there's some relationship between the L1 norm um, of a two class and the stable form of length. And probably if there is some relationship, um, this relationship will involve a factor of four because um, the L1 norm is something like twice the normalized Euler characteristic. And stable commutative length is something like a half this, the normalized Euler characteristic. So I expect a relationship of L1 norm equal to four times stable commutative length, um, if there's a relationship. Okay. okay, so first of all, I want to um, make sense of um, this example. Yeah, these examples there look very diff very similarly. Maybe I can relate these examples to make uh, sense of those numbers four and a half. Okay, so again, these are the um, surfaces from the example. Suppose I have a genus two surface and I now approximate this genus two surface with other surfaces to compute the L1 norm of this um, genus to surface. Then what I'm also doing is I uh, am approximating the two halves of the surface um, where I cut along um, uh, the middle. And this then will give me an approximation for a stable commutative length. And on the other hand, if I approximate the stable commutative length here by um, mapping um, surfaces um, with boundary components, um, exactly the red bits here, uh, to these um, spaces, then I can glue those guys together and I get an approximation for the Euler characteristic of the genus to surface. Yeah? So let's make sense of this. So I can maybe guess that there's a relationship, and in this case there is. So the Euler, so the um, L1 norm of this top dimensional class will be equal to, I get the contribution of four SCL from the left-hand side, and I get a contribution of four SCL from the right-hand side, yeah? So in this case, let's just check the numbers, it makes sense, yeah? Four is equal to four times a half, plus four times a half, yeah? So I would expect that the Euler characteristic contribution on, on both sides is, is sort of the same, and um, I have this um, equation. And hopefully this equation also holds more generally. And indeed, this is the case. So I can, we can generalize this and say, whenever you have a finitely presented group with vanishing circuit homology, which is necessary to so if you approximate the right um, two classes, um, and you have a, an element in the commutative subgroup, then you can form a new, a new group by taking two copies of this uh, group and gluing them together. And um, this will give you a two class um, where you can compute the L1 norm on the nose as well, um, eight times uh, the stable commutative length of the element you start with, which is four SCL on the one side plus four SCL of the other side. Yeah. Okay, so in, 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 in this case here, just to remind you, um, the group we would start with would be the free group on two generators, namely the fundamental group of um, one of these bits here. The element would be um, exactly the commutator relation, yeah, so the, the loop um, represented by uh, the red bit in here. And uh, well, then I, uh, if, I, if I take um, a commutator relation in one group and a commutator uh, in one figure group, and I take a commutator relation in another figure group, and I glue those together um, and form the amalgamated free products, I get um, the, the surface of genus two relation, yeah, so this gives me the genus to um, uh, surface group. And um, in the genus to surface group, I have one uh, top dimensional um, uh, homology class and it satisfies exactly uh, this condition here. Yeah. Okay, so this gives me a linear relationship between stable commutative length and the L1 number of those classes. And um, 
let's just uh, think which side um, will profit from this relationship, and it's going to be this side here. Okay? Because for stable commutative length, there are many, many um, ways to compute um, stable commutative lengths because it relates to many different areas of mathematics. Okay, so now we have uh, done step one. We now know a way of computing uh, and constructing uh, interesting uh, two classes. And we now need to feed in this machinery interesting groups with um, a good control of a stable commutative length. Okay? And I just want to, um, give you, to give you an idea about uh, the scope of stable commutative length. So we now um, seen one definition um, of stable commutative length involving surfaces. There's another one involving quasimorphisms. Um, there's a third one involving the commutator um, length. And um, stable commutative length relates to many different fields, for example, to rotation numbers, which is um, due to Gs. And um, by the work of Caligari and others, um, their uh, stable complex is now fairly well understood in many classes of groups. For example, in the free group, there is a polynomial time algorithm to compute stable complex length of arbitrary elements, and also in certain amalgamations. Okay, so um, here is the result with Clara, um, which uh, about stable complex length of uh, classes of uh, groups which satisfy this homological condition we need it um, in uh, to to construct uh, two classes, and uh, namely, well, there are there is um, explicit finitely generated groups to alpha with vanishing um, two homology. Um, and elements such that the stable complement length of this element G alpha is alpha, where alpha is all rational numbers, and alpha can also be uh, chosen to be um, these numbers. And the significance of these numbers is, well, they are concrete. And we have concrete examples um, where you compute stable complement length. And um, they are transcendental um, uh, for all n smaller than one. Are smaller than two, and moreover, um, there's a, a family um, of those numbers such that those numbers are linearly independent over the algebraic numbers. So, as an algebraic set, this is this is really really big. Okay. And so, what are these groups, G alpha? Um, so, these groups are actually the uh, they can be chosen the same, the G alpha for the, all rationals, and it can be chosen to be the universal central extension of Thompson's group T. And uh, here, um, uh, certain uh, central extensions of SL2 as that's a joint half. <clears throat> and what's the idea of the proof of these statements? Um, here, so the, the both groups have in common that they act in a nice way on uh, the circle. And as I said before, there's a relationship between stable complex length and rotation numbers, and we exploit this in this case. And but the, the problem is, if you just if you do it like this, you get a two homology. So you want to kill off the two homology, and you do this by passing to um, significantly high um, central extensions. Um, in the case of the Thompson group, to the universal central extension, and this will kill um, the two homology. Okay, so good. We now have a procedure. Um, if we feed in these groups in uh, the previous um, statements about uh, the L1 number of two classes, we now have a procedure to um, construct all rational numbers as the um, L1 norm of two classes, integral two classes. Okay, but we just got two classes, so we need four classes. How are we getting four classes? Um, and the answer is we just um, take the product with the surface and we prove the statement. And the statement is that uh, if you take an arbitrary two class and you take the product with the surface, um, then the L1 norm of this four class is on the nose equal to the L1 norm of um, the class uh, you started with, 
times the class of uh, the uh, one norm of the surface, which if, for example, if you put in the genus two surface, um, this is just going to be four, okay? Um, so controlled factor. And actually, the, we can prove uh, the statement in a bit more general, generality. And um, what's the idea of the proof? Uh, well, this involves um, Barnard cohomology. And um, uh, so first of all, um, I should say that uh, the uh, uh, proof is 100% based on um, the result by Boucher, who proved the same result uh, for alpha being a surface as well. And um, we could generalize this using Barnard cohomology and um, uh, in sort of the hard bit is to uh, estimate the norm of certain co-cycles, which is um, done um, using combinatorics. Okay, so now we have four classes where we know the uh, L1 norm of, but we do not have manifolds yet. And now um, this is done by um, Tom's uh, realization theorem. And it says that if I have a four class, an integral four class in um, a finitely presented group, then actually, I can realize this integral for class as the uh, simplicial volume or as the um, yeah simplicial volume of a four manifold and a similar statement is also true for higher dimensions, possibly um, with a factor uh, sort of an integral factor coming in so maybe I don't get the um, l one norm on the nose but some multiple of this one norm yeah but I can control this multiple. Okay, so let's just summar summarize what we did. Um, first of all, we um, constructed, we made a relationship between two classes and uh, the L1 number of two classes and stable commons length in step one. And then we, um, in this relationship, we uh, feed it in a nice, uh, nice class of groups where I know the stable commons length of. Okay, this gives me controlled L1 norms. Um, in degree two. Then I um, took those two classes and uh, took the product with the surface and I got four classes and I did some bottom cohomology and I figured out the L1 norm of these four classes. And finally, I put this into Tom's realization theorem to get manifolds. Okay, click. And this finishes the proof of theorem A. And to get um, simplicial volumes in high dimensions, um, uh, this is done using a similar um, similar procedure. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I need the two classes, which we now have done, and um, I need to feed these two classes interesting um, elements. And then um, I sort of skip the third step because I don't have a nice enough um, um, theorem for four classes. I, I don't have a theorem uh, as I take a two class and I take the product with a hyperbolic three manifold and then I can control the um, L1 norm of this five class in terms of the product of, of both. I, I, we don't know this. So we don't get anything like this on the nose for higher dimensions. And But there's a, a version of Tom's realization theorem for higher dimensions. So this is, this is how you prove theorem B. Okay. So now, of course, the question remains. So what is the set of stable of simplicial volumes in um, dimension four or in, in high dimensions? And here's the guess. So um, first of all, to, to um, introduce this guess, I first need to talk about um, computable numbers. I will define right computable numbers in a bit. So what is a computable number? It's a number alpha such that there is a computer program depicted by this computer, such that I um, put in a tolerance and um, of how well I want to know this number. And this computer program returns me an interval where this number is. So for example, I can put in um, um, the tolerance 10 to the minus 20. And I ask my computer, what is pi? 
up to tolerance of 10 to the minus 20, and it will return me the first 20 digits of pi. And here's an example, <laughs> pi, and I put in a tolerance of half, and it returns me, uh, the computer tells me pi lies between 3 and 3.5, yeah, and this spread interval. Okay, so what are right computable numbers? Right computable numbers are numbers such that, again, there is a computer program um, or a Turing machine, if you like, um, such that um, I can compute a sequence alpha n of um, non-negative real numbers, uh, such that this sequence is descending and is approximating my number alpha from above. So um, a typical question is, oh, but this looks like every uh, non-negative real number is right computable. But this is not the case because there are just countably many um, Turing machines. And thus, there are just countably many right computable numbers as well. Yeah, this, this set is it's definitely countable. Okay, so here's an example again. Suppose alpha is again pi, then this computer program returns me sequence alpha n um, such that it will um, uh, approximate um, pi from above. Maybe it will never reach pi, and I have no control over how fast it approximates pi. Yeah, so maybe alpha um, one billion is four, and alpha one billion and one is three point nine. Um, I have uh, no control when I reach alpha, and crucially, um, not all computable numbers are right computable. So it's it's it's. Um, uh, other way around. Not all right computable numbers are computable. So every computable number um, can be certainly approximated in this way because I, I, I've just given you this. Um, I know that it's um, uh, about um, intervals. Yeah, if I make my intervals smaller and smaller and smaller, I can just always pick the um, upper bound of uh, upper limits, upper end of this interval, and this gives me the sequence of um, numbers which compute to my computable number. But there are right computable numbers which are not computable. Yeah, so we do not know this number um, on up to an arbitrary tolerance. <coughs> um, this can test numbers can be constructed using the halting set, for example. Okay, so why am I telling you about right computable numbers? What does this have to do with simplicity volume or with stable computer length? So. Again, what is the set of simplicity volumes in degree four? Um, we've just basically seen um, this is um, the set, if I have a finitely, gen finitely presented group with a vanishing second homology, then um, given, an, uh, given the stable computing of an element, I can go ahead and um, uh, construct my two class, my four class, my four manifolds using tumorization, and I, I get a manifold where I can control the simplicity volume of this manifold using um, the stable computer length of the element I started with. Yeah, so so this um, uh, inclusion is up to some factor true. Yeah, you've just seen the proof. Okay. Um, now. I want to look at a slightly different set. I want to look at the set of stable computer length of recursively finite groups. What's a recursively finite group? It's a set of um, finitely generated um, subgroups of finitely presented groups. And um, this, uh, the set of these stable computer length, um, um, you can um, determine on the nodes to be the set of right computable numbers. And uh, this is something I did last year. Okay, so this is this is promising. We know one of these sets on the nose. We know that that the set of stable uh, stable of recursively finite groups is exactly equal to the set of right computable numbers. And also, together with Clara, we know that um, the set of simplest volumes in the before and also in high dimensions is a subset of the right computable numbers. Okay. So this raises the question, maybe all of those sets are actually equal, yeah? The only thing left to do is um, understanding this set better, the, the set of stable computer length 
of fine groups and group with vanishing second homology. Once I, when I, when I know that this set is the set of right computable numbers, which amounts to um, saying that this subset, this set is a subset of this set, um, then I'm done. And well, there are many ways of putting recursively finite groups into uh, finite represented groups. So there's some some hope that some of those ways will preserve um, stable competent length and maybe if I do this uh, embedding cleverly enough, I uh, can make sure that these groups don't have any uh, real um, second homology and then I would be done. Then I would show that maybe the set of, uh, that then the set of simple volumes in the before is on the nose equal to the set of right computable numbers. Okay, these are the references. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening.